think the focus in media needs to be about equity ownership, not like raising millions and millions. Welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, the podcast on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category defining founders, all in just 40 minutes. Today, we're joined by Ishita Cabra, Forbes 30 Under 30 and founder and CEO of Byrotation, the award-winning app creating the world's largest shared wardrobe available in the UK and US. Often dubbed as the Instagram for fashion rental, Byrotation has achieved amazing milestones since its launch in October 2019, including building a community of over half a million like-minded rotators, saving over 100,000 metres of textile waste from going to landfill in 2023, and raising over 2.5 million in seed funding. I followed Ashita's journey with Byrotation for a while so, and have been super excited to get her on the podcast. So today is that day and I'm really excited to dig into her journey so far, learn a bit more about her upbringing and how she became a product and customer focused CEO living between London and New York City. So Ashita, a big welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? Thanks so much, James, for having me. It's Friday morning. I've worked out. I'm in a good place. I'm in my happy space. Oh, I love that. I love that. And the sun is shining. It's an autumnal day with sunshine, which I is actually one of my favorites. So couldn't be more excited to have you on the podcast and to hear all about birotation. But before we dive into all of that, I'm going to give you a few little quickfire questions just to warm you up. Please finish the following sentences after me. Number one. Success means to me peace with myself. Love that. Yeah. That which is not always easy to come as a founder. There's 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 so much going on. There. No. <laughs> but if you're finding peace, that is lovely. But you're never happy. Yeah, that's so true. That is so true. I think that's a good reminder to us all that, that actually sometimes just finding some peace and it's very easy to always be always on and always like wanting more, but actually finding peace is a is a wonderful thing. Thank you. The best day in my career to date was when? I think it's when I learned that a woman was using her rental income from biorotation to fund her IVF journey. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Things like that, you must, that's incredible validation, isn't it, for the impact you're having and, you know, you're, you're having a real positive effect on someone's life. That's, that's incredible. It also just felt like it was so much more than I ever intended for biorotation to be. So, yeah. Love that. Thank you for sharing. One piece of advice I'd give my younger self is? I used to be a graphic designer since the age of 11. And I kind of wish I never gave all that stuff up. Because I mean, content creation and, you know, social networks, they became such a big part of growing up later when I was in my 20s. And if I hadn't given that up, we would be, I think, at a different level. Wow, that's that. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll get into your upbringing stuff. That sounds a very early age to be doing that. So that's fascinating. Okay, thank you for sharing. And final quick part question, my biggest failure to date is? I think hiring poorly. Okay, this is a common theme on the podcast. And as a headhunter, we'll probably dive into a bit later. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll tease our audience with that there and we'll come back to it. Awesome. Well, Pyrotation is an amazing business. I can't wait to talk about that. But we're going to start at the beginning and learn a bit more about your upbringing. So how did your upbringing shape the person you are today? Oh, so I was born in India in Rajasthan, which is a desert state. And I moved to Singapore at the age of two and a half. So I really see myself as a global citizen or a third culture kid. So for me, it was very clear to me that I wanted to belong everywhere and anywhere. And if I were to build a business, it would need to be for people of all walks of life, which I think has really guided Byrotation's business model and strategy. You know, we're very community oriented. We're very socioeconomically inclusive we care a lot about diversity and variety on the platform when it comes to the kind of items you see on there. And finally, it's a very scalable business model that actually has already you know, undergone international expansion with our US expansion last year. So it's been really, really, I think it kind of comes back to the person that I am. And oftentimes my stakeholders will joke with me that who is the birotation customer? Because I feel like it's you. You know, you're the embodiment of the customer. You've built something for yourself. You use it every day. And a lot of your customers now want to be like you. Mm. 
That's so interesting. Yeah. I love how that sort of global international upbringing has kind of directly impacted the business you're building. Uh, yeah, that makes a, a lot of sense. Thank you very much. I guess it sounds like you had, you know, you were kind of building some entrepreneurial skills from a very early age. So what were your aspirations growing up? And was there always that kind of entrepreneurial itch that you were looking to scratch at some point? Yeah, I think, I mean, I grew up in a very entrepreneurial household. So my father has a rags to riches story. You know, he he was the first generation um, immigrant who moved or expat whatever you call it, those words, the way that they use, it's very interesting in Asia, who gets to be an expat, who gets to be an immigrant. It's, it's very fascinating. But my dad moved to Singapore, you know, when there was a construction boom. He really made it for himself all on his own. You know, he educated, he put himself through studies, even though his, his parents told him there was no point, you know, going beyond high school. And he really made something out of himself. And I think I would hear all these stories growing up and learn about things like how to negotiate with someone, how to do business deals, how to be more street smart, you know, things that you cannot learn, I guess, in schooling. These would be the things that my dad would teach us kids on Sunday mornings. I remember we used to be so annoyed. We used to be like, we just want to go rollerblading. We just want to hang out with our friends. We just want to be regular kids. But it's funny because all of these things sort of come back to me now. And I'm like, wow, I'm really my dad's daughter. I do feel some of this stuff is innate, you know, things like leadership, things like having the guts, the grit, because I, you know, as you know, being a founder, it's it's one of the most painful things you can do to yourself. And I think tenacity is probably one of the, it's the most important, I think, personality trait that you need to possess if you're going to be a successful founder. It's actually not, it's not really things like being the smartest or the most strategic. I think tenacity is the most important thing because you have a lot of people who don't want to last bad times. They just don't want to do it. You know, they're like, this is not enough to me. I'm not going to bother putting my time in here. I need to be more strategic. I'm leaving this race. I'm going to go do something else. So I think tenacity is something that I really saw in my dad and my parents, you know, first generation immigrants trying to make it in Singapore, trying to provide for their family. And I think that's something that I really grew up around. I was fascinated by marketing when I picked up graphic designing at the age of 11. I thought it was so interesting that advertisements had this this sort of influence on people to basically manipulate them into doing whatever they wanted. And I thought that was very intriguing. You know, the dark side of me found that very fascinating. And I was like, wow, I want to be a marketeer. You know, like I want to join one of these ad agencies. And I was kind of, you know, I was young, I was 12, 13, and I didn't fully, I guess, understand what it's like to work in an ad agency. So I did a couple of internships at one of these, you know, big names when I was 14 and 15. And I kind of understood that I probably wanted to do something fully of my own, but I just didn't know what it was going to be in. So my first job out of uni was working in investments. So I worked in finance. But I think that time that I spent six and a half years in the industry really helped me figure out what kind of business it was that I wanted to found myself. Right. How interesting. Yeah, it's funny. We we often do see people taking that path of starting out in a corporate world, whether it's banking or consulting or or law, and then Mm -hmm. making that pivot to starting a business. And I know that by rotation started as a side hustle. So if you don't mind, we'd love to hear a bit about that origin story, how you eventually got it started. And I guess, what was the point you decided to take the full leap of faith to go all in on entrepreneurship? Yeah. So I was planning my honeymoon and I was like, this is a trip of a lifetime. It would be so cool to wear amazing outfits and go to amazing places and back to the desert of Rajasthan where I'm from, you know, and kind of reconnect with my roots, show my husband where I'm from, all of that, I guess, you know, romantic stuff. And that's when I started thinking it would be amazing if I could rent these high quality dresses and outfits. But I noticed that there was a lack of options in the UK but there were quite a few options globally. You know, you've got a couple of listed companies in the US who do that now. You've got a couple of other large companies that went through Series C, D of funding in China and India. Singapore, where I grew up, there's a player there that's currently fundraising. And I think one of the things that I noticed was all of them had 
one business model in common, which was they all had inventory, they all had warehouses, they all had subscriptions, and they were essentially a dry cleaning and logistics business. That wasn't something that impressed me, especially when I looked at their inventory. You know, I looked at all the listings and offering that they had on their websites, and I thought, none of this is stuff I would wear on an amazing holiday. This is all, you know, either office wear or it's things you'd wear to like a ball. You know, there was nothing kind of in between for the contemporary woman. And that's when I started thinking about this idea that I had, which was, what about getting people to rent and lend with each other? You know, you've got so many people, especially on a social media channel like Instagram, who don't repeat their outfits because they've already posted it on their Instagram grid. So where, where do these clothes go? So this idea kind of started brewing in my, in my mind. And then um, it wasn't actually until we went on our honeymoon three and a half months later that I saw a lot of textile waste in my suburban hometown, which I hadn't visited in more than 14 years. And, you know, a lot of textile, like a lot of what you see is made in India. Uh. And sadly, 90% of what we donate to charities like Oxfam end up going back to landfills in Asian and African countries. So they end up back in India, you know, because the Western world doesn't want it anymore. So they dispose it off in the so-called developing nations. And I think that's something that really upset me as someone who's a proud Indian, you know, I still have my, my Indian passport. I just felt like I was part of the problem. And obviously, you know, it's a pretty known fact that the fashion industry and, you know, a bunch of these sort of other industries adjacent to it, like media and entertainment, you know, they're quite, they're not very inclusive. So I just couldn't help but feel that all of this felt very racist and I wanted to do something to change it. And I knew that the fashion industry wasn't going to change. It wasn't something that I could do. I didn't have the connections. I didn't have the power. I didn't have the experience. However, I could get the consumer to change their mindset and their behaviors. And that's when I came up with the idea of a community-powered sharing economy for fashion. Such a great idea. And I love the purpose behind it. We definitely need more businesses like Bio Rotation. And uh, I love how personal it is to your story. And already, you know, we'll come on to whether this is today, you can see the, in, the huge impact it's having, which is, is awesome. I guess taking you back to those early scrappy days, what were your biggest lessons from the early parts of building a business? I guess, particularly for any other founders that might be in the thick of it at the moment. And then would love to hear a bit about how the business has evolved to where it is today. Yeah, I think in the early days, I wasn't fully sure if this is what I wanted to leave my full-time career in investments for. It was sort of like a really high opportunity cost of leaving that behind. And also I was here on a visa. So I had a lot that I had to give up essentially. And I guess, I don't know if it's like a gender thing, maybe it's a cultural thing. I was risk of us, essentially. I wasn't the kind of person who woke up one morning, you know, on the edge of my bed and said, this is it. Today's the day that I'm handing in my notice. I've decided to take that leap of faith. It was definitely nothing as romantic as that. I had a financial model. I had milestones and targets that I had to hit before I, I would even consider giving my career up and my lifestyle up for going full time on by rotation. Um, the early days, you know, we had, you know, a bunch of freelancers kind of helping me on the engineering side, on the marketing side, on the PR side. And it's so funny because five years later, we just celebrated our fifth birthday earlier this week. Five years later, they're still working with by rotation. And I think that's one of the things I've, I find that very, very special. And I think it's quite personal building a business. And, you know, we're still a small business. We're just at that seed funding stage. It's such a small team that we have that to me, every person can add a lot of value and bring all the good vibes or they can really take away from it. So I think one thing I've really realized over the last five years is that the people that are around me and are building by rotation, those are the people that I want to invest the most in. But yeah, I mean, in the early days, I mean, within five and a half months, we ended up being in COVID restrictions which meant that there was no need for you to rent any clothes. So we actually spent that time while we had a captive audience who was essentially spending all their time on their phones and on the internet to connect with people and feel less lonely. 
um, we spend that time educating people on why it makes sense to rent and share your fashion with each other, how you can make money. So a lot of brand awareness and education around this completely disruptive business model and idea that we were launching, which actually was great because we are a two-sided marketplace. So supply is essential and high quality supply, especially within the fashion category, requires buy-in from people that other people can trust. So, you know, we had a lot of VIPs such as Stacey Dooley, Ellie Golding, Dame Helen Mirren, Abisola Mole, Diana Asher Smith. We had a lot of these like great, you know, well-known, well-revered British names that were endorsing by rotation completely organically, either because they were renting from it to go to any of their events or their filming, or because they were lending out their own wardrobe. You know, there's there's a few gowns from the red carpet from Helen Mirren, for example. Ellie Golding's got her entire tour wardrobe on the Virotation app. Like these kind of things I think really helped us in the early days to get people to realize, hey, it's it's actually acceptable to rent stuff. In fact, it's kind of cool. Like I'm gonna tell people that I rented my outfit for Virotation because that's what Stacey Dooley is doing. And I'm I love Stacey Dooley. So yeah, we were very lucky. And, you know, again, it didn't come with any, you know, these were all organic endorsements because one of the great things about the UK is that people do care about the climate crisis and sustainability. Mm, it's so true. It's so true. And, uh, you know, you can really see why it would capture the attention of so many people because people want to play their part and we all can play our part. And I think that's that's what's... In very small ways. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a slight just shift from just the way that we've always done things, but it makes an impact. And if that has a compounding effect, then the world will be a, a better place, you know, for sure. I guess the way that we are positioning it is that, you know, we never wanted it to be like, oh, you're a terrible person because you shop at fast fashion brands. And, you know, you should give all that up now and you can only rent designer clothes on fire rotation. We are very, very careful to make sure the messaging was inclusive. It was fun. It was joyful. You know, it brought a different kind of emotional experience than just buying clothes from fast fashion brands or buying designer clothes from high-end stores. That connection between your lender and renter, that was the main driver, I would say, of the positive feelings that people were having towards the biorotation brand. I think that's so important in marketplace business models. We all have some kind of viewpoint or association with the marketplaces of today. I'm sure you've got an adjective that you describe Uber or Airbnb or eBay, for example, you know, and I think it was, it's so important for us to associate ourselves with all the positive words and feelings uh, when you hear the word by rotation. So that was something that we were very, very careful about. That's amazing. I guess, you know, we've obviously talked a bit about it, but I'd love for, for our listeners that may not have the app or maybe super excited. I'm sure many will download it after this, but how does it actually work and who's it for? What can listeners expect from downloading it? I'd just love to bring it to life a bit for our audience. Yeah. So Biorotation is a social network where you can lend and rent fashion and other lifestyle category goods on the app. People are making more than £4,000 a month from their side hustle of lending out their wardrobes, their high-end suitcases, their ties, and increasingly homeware items. So it's really interesting. It's where, like, I would say working professionals are essentially sharing their premium lifestyle goods with each other and monetizing them. And one of the things we've seen is that people are actually making 10x of, say, a dress that they bought. So maybe they bought a dress for 200 pounds. They've made over 2,000 pounds from renting it out to other women while actually owning it themselves. So the app predominantly has 90% women on there who I would say are working corporate professionals, you know, high disposable income, they're tastemakers, and we've got over half a million of them in the UK and more recently in the US. And it's been super exciting, you know, building the world's largest shared wardrobe. Besides the rental and resales that happen on the Virotation app, it's very, very interesting because we're kind of becoming more of a media platform. You know, it is a social network at the end of the day, but you'll see that there's a lot of eyeballs that use the Virotation app every day. Even if they're not renting or lending today, they're still using the app for inspiration and ideas as to, you know, what other people are buying. You know, everyone's kind of nosy and they want to see 
like, oh, like what are the new listings on the app? That means this is what the people bought. So it's like a true and accurate representation of what's actually being consumed by people, not what newsletters and brands are pushing to you through their marketing. Just a quick one from me before we hear more pocket-sized mentorship from today's 40-minute mentor. This episode is brought to you by Foundation Partners, the embedded people function service that scales from inception to growth. Foundation Partners have been the go-to partner for over 200 leaders globally who want to create high-performing teams and companies through aligning your people strategy with your business strategy. Alongside JBM and Unleashed, Foundation Partners is also part of Amplified Group, the people services supergroup that supports tech companies from inception all the way to IPO. To find out more about Foundation Partners, head over to www.foundationpartners.co.uk or get in touch with people at foundationpartners.co.uk. Now back to today's 40 Minute Mentor. We've already talked about, I guess, the the environmental impact and purpose that you have behind the business. But I'd love to understand a bit about how do you juggle purpose and profit? Because it's something that we've, we've actually done a whole episode on this topic about the fact that you can have those two things hand in hand. But I guess as you scale, as the business becomes more more complicated, as you kind of have pressure from investors to, to, to give them the returns, like how do you think of it as you're building that business? And do you have any advice for others listening to this that are trying to build a purpose-driven startup about how you can do the two at the same time? Yeah, I mean, there's like um, so many hypes and fads that we've seen in consumer tech. We saw during COVID, some of the other peers in our space moving into B2B, SaaS, into B2C, like anything to, I guess, chase sales and show that the market is massive. But, you know, I always had this vision, this tunnel vision even, that by rotation and this problem of waste in the fashion industry, which by the way is the third most polluting industry in the world, it you know, it overtakes things like maritime and aviation. It's not the flights that are causing problems. I mean, they are still causing problems, but it's actually the fashion consumption, especially exacerbated by all these fast fashion brands. And you know, obviously don't want to name them, but there's a couple of Chinese giants that have really grown momentum in the Western world, which is just it's horrific. It's terrible for even humans. And that's something that I think most people don't even realize. But yeah, I, I think um, you know, there's, there's this pressure to show that there's a massive tan for fashion rental by chasing all kinds of different models. But for me and for by rotation, you know, our mission is to transform consumption for good. And we're starting with the fashion category to begin with, because it is a terrible, terrible and wasteful industry when it comes to things like pollution so yeah, we you know we chose not to experiment with these different models, which actually ended up working out better for us in the long run. I have more than 70% of equity in the business, which I think is unheard of for a lot of founders at our stage. And unfortunately, female founders are actually encouraged to give up more equity in the early stages, which I would have never agreed with, given my background in finance. And I think it's it's just been really, really interesting seeing that other players have kind of been swayed into all these sort of other sexy business lines which haven't really served them well in the end and just ended up destroying shareholder value and brand and image in front of their customers so we've been very very mindful about everything we do you know even say a marketing campaign or a photo shoot or an event it has to come back to our core values which are of accessibility you know scalability convenience joy and community you know, those are the things that we always come back to and we ask ourselves, do they actually fit in with our core values? Do they actually still have our main mission of transforming consumption for good kept in mind? And yeah, I think I think a lot of people forget that because they sign up to all kinds of crazy targets, especially when you take on venture capital. But I'm very lucky in that my investors and I share very similar values when it comes to building a business that actually has its fundamentals right, and actually is completely defining a category. Love it. Love it. It's really great to hear that. And that takes time, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah it does. It's not about the next round of funding. And I think there's a lot of short-term, short-termism, whatever you want to call it, myopia, 
when it comes to consumer tech and investing in these consumer businesses, which which look sexy and you know get a lot of hype in the early days. So you expect a quick exit and you know a quick round to kind of you know say, oh yeah, my investment in this company has gone 10x within two years, and it isn't like that. And I think that that VC growth playbook strategy, I think it's completely dependent where you know fundraise you know funding for consumer tech has gone completely dry and in the UK venture capital when it comes to consumer is not really venture capital it's more private equity yeah exactly i really love the fact that you have values aligned investors that really see what you're building and are there for the long haul i will say it helps that i have a very large majority in the business they have to join on board my values. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But no, but this is important for founders to hear. It's a bit of both. Yeah, it's, it's important for founders to hear, I think. Of course, there is a, in a difficult economic climate, I, I think there is perhaps a, when you want to build something and there is potentially people are giving away too much equity, they're, they're taking funding because they feel they have to. And actually, I think things are picking up, but um, I do think that this is a really good story to tell. One of the things that I think is, you know, often covered in media is, oh, I raised so many millions. And then the focus becomes on how do you raise millions? You know, and that's the question that everyone's asking founders. And I'm like, actually, that shouldn't be the focus. The focus should be what have you done after raising all that money? And also, how much have you had to give up? How do you protect not giving up so much of your company? And I think that is missing in discussion because often what happens, especially during tough times, is the founders who don't have much equity left in the business, they don't feel as connected to the business anymore. It's no longer worth their time. Yeah, no, so true. Yeah, the focus needs to be on ownership of the company as a founder. The founder is the parent of the company. You know, there, there's been a lot of talk because of uh, the Airbnb co-founder and CEO, Brian Chesky, talking about founder mode with Paul Graham. And I think it's such an important discussion. You know, founders are parents of the business. Like for us, we feel deeply connected to the company, to the brand, to the early days, to the vision that we had for the business all along. And if you take away most of that, those responsibilities, even you know the legal dynamics around it by giving up so much equity, you're suddenly less interested in being the parent. You're like, ah, this is a basket case, child. And you, it's not even really mine anymore. So why should I give it more? Why should I nurture it further? So yeah, I think the focus in media needs to be about equity ownership, not like raising millions and millions. This is such an important topic. Thank you so much for raising it. And uh, it's the perfect segue to talk about your fundraising experience. But I think maybe we should focus a bit more in on this. Like, How have you done it this way? If you don't mind sharing your experience and just advice for any founder listening to this saying, I, this is the path I need to, to go down. Like, What can others learn from your experience? And what do you think founders should be thinking about as if they're currently fundraising? What, what can help them not give too much equity away, but also find the right sort of the right investors go on the journey with them? Yeah. I mean, people don't like hearing this when I say it. And actually, a founder told me this recently. She was like, oh, I remember I was asking you some questions the first time I met you. And I was like a bit taken aback by how direct you were about how I just need to focus on my product and put in the hard work and not really chase things like investors and fundraising. Like first actually get an MVP out there. And I thought, well, you know, she's just saying that because she already has investment. But I followed your advice in the end because I didn't have a choice. And actually now I get it. Now I have people coming to me and telling me that they want to invest and asking me to tell me more about what I'm building. And I think a lot of people don't want to hear it though. You know, they just want to jump to like the sexy part of it, which is I raise millions or I'm I'm the boss now, I'm the CEO, I've got a PA, you know, I've got a you know, in an office, I've got employees, you know, all that sort of like glamorous stuff. And funnily enough, like my dad, you know, who for him, being an entrepreneur is a completely different meaning to what it is today. It's not about posting on Instagram or LinkedIn about your founder journey every single day. Like it's not about that. He did it because he had to feed his family. He had to make something of himself. And that's the way I view being a founder and an entrepreneur. It's about making a profit. And hopefully adding value to the society, which I think I'm doing through what Buy Rotation's mission is. But for me, the business needs to turn a profit and actually be adding economic and social value to the society. And I think a lot of founders and entrepreneurs don't, I'm not sure that the new generation fully kind of understands that concept of profitability. 
So I think my mindset when it comes to things like, you know, starting off and trying to start getting ready for fundraising is, especially if you're in the UK and you're listening to this, the way that early stage works here, it's very, very private equity oriented mindset. It's not a venture mindset. You know, people are risk averse when it's consumer, especially if you're doing things like fintech, health tech, I think there's a lot of, and AI, obviously, these are all sexier. So you'll probably get buy-in quicker than people doing consumer and consumer tech. But I think showing proof of concept and an MVP is incredibly important. And you mentioned this in my intro, but I'm very, very product oriented. Even last night, you know, at a dinner, I was talking about product to an influencer who was actually like, it's so interesting that you are very involved with the features of your app. Like, I wouldn't really expect that of you. You're just, you know, you're, you're here dressed up at an influencer dinner, but here we are talking about the wallet feature on the app. And you're clearly very excited about it. And I think that's super important. Like, you have to be close to your product and or your customer. Otherwise, why are you building this? You know, I, I meet founders who are like, I'm going to be the visionary and then I'm going to hire all these people to do it for me. And I'm like, what is a visionary's job? I don't fully understand. So I think this whole, like, I think when there was, you know, this, this funding boom, there were a lot of these visionaries who could get away with it and they were put on a pedestal. But for me, I think I, I'm an operator. Then, yeah, yeah, you are. And I, I think you need to be, particularly in the early stages of business. So important. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You have to be. Yeah, you've got to do everything. Yeah. And that's like exposing. I remember in the, the first couple of years of JBM, I am not, unlike you, <laughs> I do not have a finance background. The numbers side of things is really not my forte. But there was actually something very important about learning about marketing, sales, and of course, doing the day job of headhunting, but then actually building a cash flow model, uh, getting some help from my uncle and actually learning about all the aspects of running a business. And at the end of the day, you've got to be all over it and you've got to do the stuff that you don't necessarily enjoy and learn about things. And, and it just it is essential. And I think, and I'll be honest, I think when you outsource too early, that's where you can, you can lose a bit of control. And when there's so much at stake. I think so. And people take advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. There is absolutely a time to hire an ops person. There is a, comes time when you, when you end up holding the business back as well. So it's a balance to strike, but I complete, especially in a business like yours, like being close to the product and being really on top. I think it, it really helps. And I guess that kind of leads it clearly. You've been able to create these incredible partnerships, you know, with Airbnb, you've spoken at the UN HQ, I think I read, uh, you've, you've had all these famous people using your app. You mentioned Dame Helen Mirren, Legends, Ellie Goulding, Popstar. Like, you've clearly tapped into something that has just really resonated with a huge cross-section of, of people and businesses. So how have you gone about building those sorts of partnerships and getting that sort of traction? And what, what do you think has been some of the secrets to the success there? And for anyone listening to this, looking to kind of replicate partnerships with big brands, is there a particular playbook to follow or, or any advice you'd give them? Yeah. So with, you know, these VIPs, I mean, it's again, you know, my world has been, I mean, the first British people that I actually met and knew, well, it's my husband. <laughs> You know, I went to a, a business school in London and funny enough, a lot of Brits don't actually go to business school and they don't go to uni in London. So I actually didn't really know a lot of local people and my network with the fashion, the media, the entertainment industry, it's completely like, it doesn't exist. It's non-existent. It only has really, you know, in the last five years of building by rotation, I've been able to create these connections, but all from scratch. And I think that's one of the things I'm really proud of you know, really putting myself out there and putting in the time, showing my commitment to biorotation and our mission. I think that's one a lot of people over, again, in a very organic way. You know, these these A-list celebrities haven't been paid to talk about us. So I think it's really about showing commitment to your purpose and obviously having values that align with them. You know, all of these celebrities care about sustainability. You know, they they do wear fashion quite often. So it's it sort of like helps that we have similar values and that's where, you know, I kind of surfaced on their radar, which is amazing. As for these corporate partnerships, yeah, I think, again, this one is networking. You know, I was part of the sharing economy board as a board member and the Airbnb global policy manager was on it. So she was already becoming more familiar with bi rotation. But, you know, it took more than three and a half years to actually then end up doing things with the PR of Airbnb 
who have done other brand partnerships with us. You know, we've done things with Netaporte, we've done things with Little. So you really understand our variety. It's all the way from Little to Netaporte. You know, well, we've also done partnerships with Airbnb, with Bubble, you know, brands that I greatly admire. And I think it's been, um, it's really about having and cultivating this amazing community that people revere. You know, people want the eyeballs of our customers because our customers are smart, intelligent, working professionals who are becoming quite eco-conscious and are also pragmatic tastemakers. So it's a pretty good community that we've built and that adds value to all of these corporate partners. You know, we're paid for these partnerships. Yeah, love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you for sharing. We've got two more quick questions before we get to our wrap up I'm, and I'm conscious of time. So I really need to come back to the point around hiring given our day job. Uh, you mentioned that's yeah, it's one of the, the hardest. So do you mind just sharing one just sort of your experience of hiring and where you feel you've made the mistakes so that others listening can perhaps learn from that yeah and I think it's maybe less about the people and the people that I hired incorrectly but more like I'm my worst critic I expect so much of myself and then that makes me expect so much from others where I'm just not willing to trust and therefore delegate even though there are some tasks that others should be doing because I need to focus on other things and they might be better at those tasks. And I think I fell into that trap after raising our venture round to hire kind of vanity titles like a C-suite level role and a, you know, like a, like a head off role and things like that. And I think it was really just to send market signals that, you know, we're focusing on this and I've hired superstars with an amazing CV. And I think in hindsight, the lesson that I learned from there for an early stage business that's completely disrupting existing models within our industry, I actually should have hired people who genuinely love the product and use it. Like for me, that's the most important thing. Like the CV doesn't matter. The attitude is super important, but I also want to see them using or experimenting with the app. And I think it's so important that in the early days, especially since the team is still small, everyone's an obsessed fan. They have to be obsessed fans of my product because we are changing the industry. So people, like, you know, we ruffle a lot of feathers. We ruffle a lot of feathers of fashion brands, retailers, the industry, uh, bodies and things like that. And that's why we need complete buy-in from our team. We need them to be our biggest supporters. So I think that's, those are some mistakes that I made, you know, hiring for, for vanity titles and to send signals. And it's a very, very common thing. So yeah, she does. And I think it's okay if founders are listening to say, thinking, oh God, I've, I've done that. <laughs> that hiring is difficult. And it sometimes it makes sense. You think, oh, you want to get someone from a brand, but actually uh, mission alignment, obsession with the product, uh, genuine like desire to come on that journey. And those early days, that, these things are so important. And I think it's great to hear your honest view on that and experience because hopefully others can can really learn from that. I guess the one thing we haven't touched on yet is your expansion to the US, which is super exciting. And I'm sure lots of people listening to this will be, if they're building a business over here in the UK, that the US market is obviously has huge potential, uh, but also is, is probably a tricky one to navigate for a lot of people. So do you mind just sharing some of the biggest lessons and learnings from launching in the US and just give us a bit of a an overview of how it's going? Yeah, I think that that is probably one of the point of times where I realized we didn't actually need the C-suite level hire that I thought was like going to, you know, help me in the international expansion. Because actually it's, it was less related to our business model, which is very engineering oriented. What I maybe needed to focus more was the engineering. So scaling the app so that it can launch in a different market, things like language, product, you know, localization, and then also community, because we need to get the right kind of supply, high quality supply and great players using the app in the early days of the US so that it sets the tone right to attract the right kind of customers as well. You know, it's early days and early adoption from the right people really defines the kind of platform by rotation that's going to be in the US. And I think that's probably the lesson that I learned, which is I probably didn't allocate the right type of resources that we needed when it comes to departments in the US. We're profitable there now, which is amazing and incredible and we're growing organically. But I think just looking back, if I could change that, but again, you know, it's not like it was terrible, but if I could change that, I'd probably allocate more resources 
to community and engineering for our U.S. expansion. And yeah, and it's been very, very interesting seeing how scalable our business model is. You know, we've got plans to launch a third market next year. So we've already started our research phase of it. But this is really what I want to do with Biorotation. You know, I want it to be in every corner of the world, you know, in a little village, like a Midsummer Murders type village in the UK. And yeah, I just want it to transform consumption for good beyond the fashion category as well, which is why it's called Biorotation. You know, it doesn't have like a fashion-y name. Well, it sounds like business is thriving and it's it's super exciting, uh, you know, your ambitions for the future. And I have no doubt it'll be incredibly successful. We're sadly at our wrap-up questions, Ashita. You are on 40 Minute Mental, so I have to ask, if you could be mentored by anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I have tried to get Brian Chesky, Airbnb's CEO, to mentor me. I mean, that would be a great one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's such a blueprint of the share economy and obviously we know how to deal with the really tough situations as well, which I think is, I love learning from like challenging and tough times. And I guess someone who's definitely out of reach, uh, Larry David, I'm obsessed with him. Oh, amazing. An icon. That's a great one. First time on the podcast, I think that answer. So. I'm obsessed with him. <laughs> That's awesome. And finally, what is one piece of career or life advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with today? When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. I know it's cheesy, but all of these cheesy sayings, I think with age and experience, they really come to life. And I think it really helps you kind of understand what you're made of. So embrace the challenging times and come out the other way, becoming tougher than ever. Yeah, great place to end it. Uh, Ashita, this has been such an enjoyable conversation. Love what you're building, love the mission. And we wish you nothing but success for the rest of the year ahead. Hope you continue to have an amazing impact on the world. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. Before I let you go, I've got a little gem of a podcast I just have to share with you. It's the Alt Marketing School podcast. Whether you're a marketer with a secret cape or just a very good notepad, or you're still figuring out how to make marketing human again, this podcast is the place to be. Now into its seventh season, they have a stellar lineup of creative rebels, including Nick Entwistle from One Minute Brief, Shante Gorman from Punch Sugar Marketing, and copywriting wizard Dan Nelkin. Each episode feels like an intimate chat host Fab Giovanetti has with marketing legends. They dive into the latest trends, clever strategies, and what it means to market to hearts, not just brains. And best of all, you'll come out feeling a little more human and a lot more inspired. So honestly, if you're looking for fresh marketing insights wrapped up in a fun, relatable package, this one's for you. So search Alt Marketing School Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and give it a listen. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I really hope that you found it useful and inspiring. If we have left any questions unanswered, or if you have any feedback or guest recommendations for future series, then please make sure you get in touch on info at jbmc.co.uk. I often get asked by listeners how you can help us spread the word about 40 Minute Mentor. There are two simple ways you can help. Firstly, share this episode on your preferred social media platform, and LinkedIn is probably where I'm most likely to see it. And you can also leave us a review on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Every share on social media and review left on the podcast platforms really helps us to get 40 Minute Mentor in front of new audiences and share the power of mentorship even further. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday for even more pocket-sized mentorship. Mm-hmm.